After building the jig to create those giant hex cabinets in my last video, I've got hexes on the brain, so I built some hex shaped shadow boxes. I've dressed all my timber, I'm using some spotted gum decking. It is S4S, so it's square four sides. I've docked one end, so that's nice and square. The other end is still rough, but now it's time to cut the 30 degree angles. And for that, I prefer to use the table saw. Using an angle gauge at the table saw makes setting exact angles very easy. And a feature on all my table saw sleds is the removable inserts that allow for zero clearance plates for any angle. You can see on this set of inserts I can do 90 degrees and 30 degrees or I can just replace the whole thing for a particular angle but because these don't intersect there's no worry about any extra uh, tear out and the base plate just has four screws that I can take out and put in my 90 degree set if that's what I want. This type of crosscut sled also allows me to do dado cuts. Now you could do all of this just on the miter saw but there's a couple of issues at least with my saw that make me a little bit reluctant to do that. First, when I advance the saw head, it has a tendency to just move out a little bit. Now this can be adjusted, it's just a bit of a pain in the butt to adjust, and I primarily use the miter saw for breaking down rough stock. Secondly, this is the size of the workpiece that we're ultimately ending up with. It's no really great way to use a stop block. Yeah, I could screw something or clamp it down, but because it's so close to the edge and so small, you can use a push stick like this or a holding stick like this but it still gets my hand uncomfortably close to the miter saw blade so I think the table saw is a bit safer. The first cut takes off the first corner and I flip the board to make the next cut with the first cut up against the stop block. None of the boards I have for this project are long enough to worry about continuous grain orientation. I want the shadow box to have a back on it. There's two ways I could go about that. The first is I could cut a slot all the way around and during glue up I can have that panel put into the slot and then glued up around it. That's good because it can help uh, bring everything into square a little bit or into hexagon I guess. The other way is using a rebate at the back. The rebate method does allow a little bit more flexibility because at this stage I'm not 100% sure whether I want to go with MDF, plywood or perhaps an acrylic for the back. So with that rebate, I can just cut it to whatever the thickest material would be, which is six millimeters for the MDF and screw it in later. Since spotted gum is so hard, this had to be done in multiple passes, raising the bit each time. The fence didn't move throughout the operation. With the rebates cut on the back, we could certainly glue it up like so. It's just gonna be a bit of a weak connection because there's an end grain to end grain connection. For the application, it's probably okay, though over time, the forces of gravity, if this is hanging on the wall, may be enough to start opening up that joint. And there's a few ways we can go about reinforcing that. Probably two main ways to look at it. One is visible joinery and one is invisible joinery. If you're happy with visible joinery, probably the easiest way is to cut a spline in each of the joints. So with the blade still tilted to 30 degrees, we just line up our pieces like so and cut a thin groove. That groove can then be filled with a piece of wood and that will provide a long grain to long grain connection with the two pieces. Another option is the humble key. Once we glue up a hex, even with just the box joins, we'll wait for that to dry, run it through a partial cut through each of those joins and plug those key slots with a key. They again can be contrasting timbers that you typically use a jig to hold that square and safely. And if you've got a biscuit joiner, this is a perfect application for it. The biscuit joiner will essentially cut a stopped groove that the biscuit fits into and it'll add some structural strength. It'll also make it a little bit easier to clamp up because the biscuit stops it from sliding around. I don't have a biscuit joiner, but I do have a Festool Domino. For my hexes, I'll be using this, but I'm also gonna show you a method to do the same thing using a router. You're gonna to want to use a plunge router. Preferably would actually use a trim router, but my trim router, for some reason, doesn't have an edge guide. 
I'm not sure Makita will even make one for it. I've got the workpiece sandwiched between two simple plywood fences that have the same 30 degree angle cut on them. This way the router is reasonably well secure or supported. Ideally I would have a little bit more width to secure this a bit better, but this will do for this purpose. I'm not going to use the right size bit, I'm using a 3 8 inch bit because that's what's in there. You'd probably want to use a quarter inch bit or smaller. If you're interested in this method and want a better explanation, recently Mark Spagnolo, the Wood Whisperer did a video on how to do these sort of complex joins with no domino and he's done a much better job of explaining it. So I'll link to that. But this is the quick and dirty way to make a floating tenon on an angle when you don't have other tools. For my actual hex, I'll be using four millimeter thick dominoes, two per joint. I start by marking out the center point for each of the mortises on both ends using a double square. The workpiece is then held in place using a hold fast. Being such a small piece, it is tricky to hold in place for the domino. A quick check to make sure everything goes together pretty easily, then I can put the domino away. Before glue up, everything is sanded up to 220 grit. Using a hand screw clamp was the easiest way I could think of to hold the parts in place while being sanded. For the glue up, I'm using liquid hard glue as it's pretty forgiving as it can be scraped or sanded much easier than PVA. As it's a cooler day, I warmed the bottle up by dunking it in hot water for a while. Glue is brushed onto the ends of each piece and in the mortises. For clamping pressure, I used blue tape to pull the joints closed. The idea was good, but I think due to the spotted gum's slightly oily nature, the tape kept letting go after a few minutes. This resulted in a couple of the joins that were less than ideal. The back panel is some secondhand black acrylic. I find thin goods like acrylic or veneer much easier to cut with the saw on top of the workpiece rather than trying to feed it through a saw. If you don't have a track saw, a jigsaw with a fine tooth blade will work, but make sure you've got cast acrylic or it'll melt. It may still melt, but you'll stand no chance with extruded acrylic sheets. To secure the acrylic, drill a 2mm hole through the acrylic into the rebate. Remove the acrylic and deepen the hole for the screw. On the acrylic, come back with a larger 3mm bit to enlarge the hole. We don't want the wood screw threads catching on the acrylic. A can of sink is optional, but it's a nice touch. Reassemble and secure with a number 6 screw. A single screw is enough to pull it all tight. This has turned out pretty well. It is a very simple project that uh, does let you test your skills a bit in terms of the angles and the mitered joinery and all of that and really should only take you about a weekend to do unless you go and get the flu like I did then it takes a little bit longer. If I was smarter I would have also glued up this one at the same time uh, and then probably joined them together in a honeycomb type pattern. In terms of joining them together there's a couple of ways obviously you could just glue them together or you can use figure eight clips to really secure them quite well screwed into the back. In terms of mounting them to the wall, you've got lots of different options. Commander strips work actually surprisingly well for this type of thing because you're not putting a lot of weight on it. A more secure way would be to use a wood material for the backs. That way you can glue a cleat onto the back of it, a French cleat, hang it on the wall. Though you might want to have a little bit more of a recess than this one which is only six millimeters so that you can hide the cleat entirely. Now that I am over the flu, I'll get back to working on my hanging cabinet. Thanks for watching. Ah, for f sake. I've just found my band clamp. That would have been much better to use than tape. At least I've got one to get right. <laughs>